Well, good morning, church. I'm glad you're here. Even if I can't be here physically with you at second service, thanks for allowing me to go down and be with the uh, congregation at the Baldwin City campus. I want to once again emphasize how, um, how much I, I hope you will consider, and then in considering, you'll reach the conclusion to come join us tonight for our 15-year celebration. If, if, if nothing else, it's just an opportunity to praise God. It's an opportunity to hear how he's been at work. And, and you have stories of how God has worked through this church in your life and, and other people do. And I'm just looking forward to hearing some of those and, and thanking God for his, again, for his faithfulness that endures and bringing us through and, and looking forward to whatever he has for us in the future. So I, I hope that you will be back tonight. We can fill this place with praise uh, for what God has done. So in the meantime, uh, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 23. Now I'm going to have you turn there, but we're going to actually start in another text from the Apostle Paul. Um, there have been several variations of the quote that you have at the top of your outline. I believe most uh, credit Edmund Burke, an English philosopher and politician, with the original version that says, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Now, that assumes that only bad things have happened in history. And, and there are plenty of bad things, but there are some good things in history to learn from. And you do want to repeat those things, don't you? But again, knowing those helps you to repeat those. I like the variation that states, those who don't learn from the mistakes of the past are doomed to repeat them. And I might add, but those who learn from the encouragements of the past can experience them in their future or in their present even. The point being, we are to learn from history in order to live well in the present and set a positive course for the future. And so again, that's why we want to celebrate Tonight, 15 years of God's faithfulness to this church. I think the Apostle Paul would agree with that sentiment. Now, he's going to share in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 a lesson from Israel's history so that the church in Corinth will learn from that. And it's an, it's an unfamiliar history to them. The Corinthian Christians that he's writing to, for the most part, probably have a very vague, if any, idea of Israel's history. And my guess is that in the time that he was in Corinth, he shared a lot of that history with them, showing God's work in his people in the past. But he wants to emphasize some history lessons for the Christians in Corinth for good reason. So if you'll bear with me, I, we're going to start there, and then we're going to show you, I hope to show you, what that has to do with our text today. So it's a, a long text. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 10 and follow along in your Bibles, you can do that. If not, it's uh, on the slides behind me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors, and, and notice how he's tying in the church with Israel, our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. We know the Exodus story. They, they, the cloud led them by, by day and the, the seas parted to leave Egypt. Verse 2, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Their salvation, their physical salvation is analogous to, to what Baptism in Christ does for our spiritual salvation, our eternal salvation. Verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual food, manna. They drank from the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Yes, two different times at the beginning of the Exodus and the end, Moses struck a rock and water poured out. But, but Paul's saying there was a rock that followed them, a spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ, present with them in the Exodus. Nevertheless, verse 5, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. You remember a generation died. Now these things, the reason why he explained or says this and, and briefly 
over, uh, just gives an overview of this Exodus history is in verse 6. These things occurred as examples to keep us, you and me, Paul's telling the Corinthians, to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So we can learn, we should learn from the history of God's people and be warned of what they did. Verse 7, do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. No sooner had Moses been on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments than the people down below were creating a, a golden calf and worshipped it. Verse 8, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. They, they intermarried with the Moabites, their enemies, and then engaged in all kinds of sexual revelry. And one day, 23,000 of them died. Verse 9, we should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. We remember looking at that story when we reviewed the life of Moses a few years back. Do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angels. So here are all these things that Israel did wrong. And, and, and if we don't learn from them, we're destined to repeat their mistakes. Verse 11, these things happened to them as there's that word again, as examples, and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. Paul's main point, God was with Israel, but Israel turned their back. Learn. Look at their example. Be warned. So he's clear. We are to learn about life. Who God is, who we are, the relationship we have with God. And all that is recorded in Israel's history. And so now, in, in, in a twist that I don't know if Paul thought of at the time, but that same principle continues as we look at the historical record of Paul in the book of Acts. So the one who told us to learn from the past is now our example to learn from his past. Does that make sense? Same lessons. We, we learn about God as we look at the historical events in Paul's life. We learn about us and we learn about our relationship with God. So it's now our turn to learn from him, for Paul to be our example. In this case, not an example of what not to do. It's not a warning. It's an example of what to do in the face of life's most intimidating faith challenges. It serves as an encouragement. So I, I, I say all that because I, I want us to view our text today as more than just an historical record. It is that. But Luke, is, Luke intends for us to get more out of this than just some facts to fill out in a, in, in a test someday. It's a history that offers us hope and peace for our lives. That's the lens through which to look at our text this morning. Paul's life in this text has something to offer you right now today in whatever issues are pressing your faith and causing you <laughs> pain and hurt. Whether it's, whether it's health issues or, or job issues or financial issues or relationship issues or issues with faith itself. What, what is pressing against you today, our text speaks into that. And I, I just, I don't want us to lose it in, the, in, the, in a text that just says, well, this is what happens next. There's more going on here than just recorded facts. Satan would attempt to turn all of the issues that we are facing into temptations. 
Temptations to turn our back on God, to deny his power over what we face. And that's at work. Remember last week, Eric pointed out in the text that the Lord was standing by Paul. And he told him, take take courage or, or, or have hope, have heart. This week we will see what Jesus did as he stood by Paul. The specifics may be different from your life, but they serve as an example. Just as the Exodus story serves as an example to the Corinthian churches and us today still, Paul's life is going to serve as an example to us. We must learn from his history. So there are three things history teaches us in our text this morning. And the first thing it teaches us that we need to know and embrace and embody and believe is that no matter how strong, deceitful, and vicious the enemy, God overcomes through his sovereign hand. See, no sooner does Jesus promise his presence, we looked at that last week, than we learn about a plot to kill Paul. So no sooner has has God stood by Paul and said, take courage. As you testified me about me in Jerusalem, you will testify about me in Rome. Luke immediately tells us the next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we've taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Do you see how demented this has become? Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander, the Roman commander, to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. Folks, this this is spiritual warfare played out in flesh and blood and Paul's the victim. Satan is unleashing his intense fury against the gospel on Paul through zealous terrorists, literally hell-bent on killing Paul. This seems like a hopeless situation, doesn't it? They've got the perfect plan. Sanhedrin, you're going to to send a message to the commander. Tell him that we would like to talk to Paul at, at greater length. And as he is on his way from your barracks to the Sanhedrin, there's going to be a, a, a group of 40-some men who are going to channel him into a, a narrow alleyway probably. And we don't know that specific, but somehow they've got it planned out. From, from the time he leaves the barracks to the time that he reaches the Sanhedrin, they're going to kill him. <laughs> then, out of the blue, verse 16. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot... He went into the barracks and told Paul. (laughs) Now, out of the blue, we find out that Paul's got family that we didn't even know about. This is the only first mention and the only mention of the fact that Paul has a sister and and now we know that he's got a nephew. We don't know how old. We don't know how young this nephew is. He seems to be kind of youngish, maybe 12, maybe 10, maybe, maybe 14. And we don't even know how he found out about this plot. Maybe Paul still had family or relatives or close friends connected to the Pharisee party. And, 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 and word kind of starts to spread that there's a plot. And, and by you know, tomorrow, Paul will be dead. We don't know any of that. And you know what? We don't need to. Because God has it all under control, doesn't he? Do you see how when you have the sovereign control of God, that no enemy can oppose you? Do you see that that's what Luke is really trying to tell us? These are the facts, but behind the facts are these truths. No matter how strong, no matter how certain it appears, they are no match for the sovereign hand of God. Anything the enemy does falls under his control. 
So the most cunning and careful plans of humans stand no chance against the sovereign hand of our Lord. Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 54 verse 17. No weapon forged against you will prevail and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Now, how does that truth of Isaiah 54, how does that play out? In Paul's case, it starts with his nephew and then it goes from there. So verse 17, Paul called one of the centurions, said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. What, the nep- what Paul's nephew told him, the commander needs to know. So verse 18, the centurion takes Paul's nephew to the commander. The centurion said, Paul the prisoner has sent me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand. Again, you can just see the sovereignty of God over all this. I I would imagine the commander most often would have just said, get him away from me. But he accepts Paul's nephew into his presence. What have you got to say? Verse 20, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. So the commander is going to be able to test whether or not Paul's nephew is telling the truth. He's predicting something that's going to happen in the next day. And when that happens, the commander is going to know that he's telling the truth. Verse 21, don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They've taken an oath not to eat or drink until they've killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. He lays out the whole detailed plan. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, Get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen, to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. So Satan fills the hearts of 40 zealots, 40 terrorists determined to kill Paul. And God puts in the mind of a Roman commander to call 470 soldiers to escort Paul to Caesarea. No matter how strong, how deceitful, how vicious the enemy appears, God overcomes through his sovereign hand. Now let's take it one step even deeper. Folks, this is the gospel. That's the message of the gospel. That no matter how strong deceitful and vicious the enemy is, God overcomes through his sovereignty. That's how Paul is saved physically. That's how we are saved eternally. Because Satan, since he's tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, we have fought unsuccessfully against our sinful nature. The enemy is too strong. We are under Satan's influence. In fact, Paul, in his letter to the Romans, called us enemies of God before our conversion. And the outcome seems certain. In another letter, Paul said we were dead in our sins and transgressions. That's, you you don't get, there's no second part of that. Dead is dead, right? Except for the sovereign plan of God. Because of his love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We were no match against Satan's powers. We were dead in sins and transgressions, enemies of God. The deceitfulness, the viciousness, The strength of our enemy was too much for us, but overcome by the sovereign hand of God. The worst Satan has to throw at us is defeated at the cross. 
The plots conspired by Satan against Paul are thoroughly defeated by God. What we see happening in Paul's life physically serves as an example to what has happened in our life spiritually. And what, may, what needs to happen in your life in this very day for what, in whatever obstacles you, to your faith that you're facing, whatever trials may be coming your way, you can know that the sovereign hand of God can overcome those, no matter how strong they may appear. Now, spoiler alert. Paul's not going to live forever. He is going to die. He's going to eventually be a martyr for his faith. But even when Satan at that point thinks he has won, God's work on the cross says otherwise, right? So, let me show you another history lesson from this text. That no matter how awkward, inconvenient, or imperfect the situation, God opens doors for his gospel. So now, for the time being, verse 35 tells us that Paul arrives in Caesarea, which is the Roman capital of Judea. He, he arrives there safely and he's taken to Herod's palace. He's safe there. If you've ever been to palaces, they're not bad places to stay. This is like God saying to Satan, not only did I rescue him, but I'm going to put him up in the palace. Five days later, a crew from Jerusalem shows up and they're going to testify against Paul. 20, chapter 24, verse 1. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. The governor's name is Felix. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. He's laying it on kind of thick, isn't he? But in order not to worry you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He's a ringleader of the, of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. And the other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. A few dozen witnesses and probably a loud commotion. That's the scene. When you think about, when you think about the ideal time, the ideal place, the ideal circumstance to give your testimony and to share the gospel, my guess is it doesn't look like this. <laughs> On trial, before a man you've never seen before, against dozens of people throwing out lies and accusations against you. But yet that's the door. God has for Paul. If you've been a part of, of, of FBC for a while, you know that we're in a capital campaign and we've called it Open Doors. We, we are raising money to, to eliminate our debt so that we can not only free up monies for greater ministries, but to, to continue giving a solid footing to the Baldwin campus. And Open Doors comes from a passage that we've We've seen before, Revelation 3, verse 8. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Those are Jesus' words to a small church just trying to, just trying to survive in a hostile environment. So why would God open doors of ministry to a, a person like Paul in chains in front of accusers? And why would God open doors to a church with little clout or little strength? The answer, in Paul's own words, is to show that the all-surpassing power 
that people see on display in our lives, they recognize that it comes from God and not from us. To reveal who He is. Which leads to the next question, does it work? Let's remember, let's, go, let's redo a, a little, little review all the way back at the beginning of the book of Acts. Chapter 4, remember when Peter and John were the first threats to the Sanhedrin and they were brought before this same governing body? Luke says this in Acts 4.13, remember? When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. There was something behind just the physical in these. They're, they're physically on the outside, they're unschooled, they're ordinary. But there's something deeper at work. These men had been with Jesus. See, I think sometimes lost in the discussion about Christians being witnesses to the good news, I think sometimes we lose, we lose God's viewpoint of the good news. How does God, what does God think about the gospel? We get tied up in, in how to share and when to share and where to share and if we will share. And we can focus too much on us and forget God's perspective about the gospel. The gospel reveals his sovereign power through his ultimate display of mercy and grace in giving his one and only son so that we might die. And that gift, because of that gift and the sacrifice of that nature, Peter could write late in his life that, that, that God wants everyone to come to repentance. He doesn't say they will, but that's, that would be how God views the gospel, that, that it would reach into people's hearts and minds and that they would respond and repent. Consequently, no matter where and when and with whom, if you look and if you listen, you'll see that and hear that God opens a door for the gospel because the gospel is his treasure. It represents the ultimate act of love. It, it reveals his character. That's how he views the gospel. I want people to know about me and in knowing about me, knowing that they can have a relationship with me. And with that then, consequently, we, we can learn the third lesson of history in this text. That no matter how intimidating, closed or threatening the person, God honors our faithful witness to the gospel. After Paul shares his story in front of a hostile audience, and he does so again very openly and honestly, verse 14, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law that's written in the prophets. And he goes on to say, I have the same hope that these men have, a hope of the resurrection for the righteous and the wicked. So he's completely open and honest of who he is and what he believes. And after he shares that, Felix sends everyone, this, this Roman governor sends everyone out. He says he wants to wait for more information. Verse 22 and 23. He was, he was acquainted with the way. He adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, I'll decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom, permit his friends to take care of his needs. But the door is God's door, and it is as open as it is surprising because Felix, the Roman governor, along with his Jewish wife, want to hear more. God wants everyone to come to repentance. His, the gospel is God's favorite story. He's the author of the story. He wants everyone to hear the story. Now, let's understand something about who Felix is. He was, according to historians, a violent, licentious, and yet also ineffective governor. He mishandles a lot of riots that happened in Caesarea because the riots were always met with even greater force, which just served no other purpose than to just rile the people up again. And so Caesarea, at his, during his reign, was, was 
characterized by a, a lot of violence, episodes of violence. His wife is a woman named Drusilla. She's his third wife. She is the daughter of the, the king of the Jews after Herod, during Jesus' time, is Agrippa. And so she is Agrippa's daughter. So she's a Jew and she's familiar with what's going on, as is he. They're familiar with what people are calling the way, the church. But like other politicians of his day, he's also very greedy. And it's that greed that closed his heart to the gospel. He was attracted to the gospel, maybe even challenged by it, but he never accepted it. He never repented. Instead, he kept, he kept waiting for Paul to offer a bribe. Chapter 24, verse 24. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. Again, just, just the openness, this... The honesty of, of, of Paul. This is, this, is, this is my story. Jesus changed my life. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You, you may leave. When I find it convenient, I'll sin for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. Basically saying, Paul, if you just give me some, some bucks, I'll set you free. I don't care what you believe. I, I don't care if you're a, a pain in the, in the neck with the Sanhedrin. Just offer me something and it's, it's all taken care of. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. It's longer than he should have, but he wanted, he, he's playing both ends. He wants everyone to like him. A few weeks ago, Matt shared with the, the Baldwin campus a quote from Mark Dever, who said, We don't fail in our evangelism if we faithfully tell the gospel to someone who is not converted. We fail only if we don't faithfully tell the gospel at all. Evangelism, this is important. Evangelism isn't itself converting people. It's telling them that they need to be converted and telling them how that can be. So Paul is faithful in the face of a very intimidating man. Notice, and he speaks about righteousness to a man characterized as, as simply of just as wicked he talked to him about self-control to a man known to be sexually immoral and unrestrained in his sexual desires. And he talked to him about the judgment to a man who has condemned his fair share of people while governing in the province of Judea. And it provoked fear, but sadly not faith. But folks, Jesus, Jesus never said that his disciples would be soul winners. He said that we would be witnesses. And when we are faithful to that call, God honors that and uses it for his own purposes. That's what this text is telling us. That God is powerful and sovereign in his control. And that, that he opens doors that are, that are unexpected and, and, and frankly ones that we would not sometimes recognize if we were not in tune with him and his spirit. And, and, and the results of those open doors, that's left up to him as well. That's up to his sovereign control. We can't, we can't convert anyone. God does that. But we have to be faithful in sharing how they are converted. And when we do, God is pleased. So the question this morning is, will history, will Paul's history repeat itself in our lives? Will we, lean, will we lean on God's sovereign control when pressed with trials and, and temptations? Will we walk through open doors that He has placed before us as, as, and look at them as opportunities regardless of the circumstances? 
And will we prove faithful with the gospel regardless of how it results? Will history repeat itself in your life, in the life of this church? Let's pray. Father, we, we do want to learn from Paul's example. And in this case, to be encouraged by it. To be inspired to lift our sights beyond our circumstances, beyond the physical, and to see you high and lifted up, sovereign and powerful, in control of the events on the, of this earth so that we would trust you even when they, these events don't make sense, to trust you even when it's, we are hard-pressed in our faith. And God, to have the sensitivity by your Spirit to take advantage of doors that open before us, weak and trembling as we may be, as intimidating as the circumstances of the person may be, that we would take advantage of every opportunity that you place before us. And God, would you be honored in that? We'll trust you with the results. We just want to be faithful. Faithful witnesses to the greatest story known to man. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.